there is no death in Christ. Colossians 3 verse 2 Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Romans 5 verse 12 Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The single sin of one man, Adam, brought death upon all of mankind. God promised Adam in Genesis 2 verse 17, In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The principle of death was introduced into the world when Adam sinned, and it has reigned on earth ever since. Do you understand this? Every graveyard, every tombstone is the evidence to the spread and reign of sin since the time of Adam. Now what is important to note is that the single sin of the one man Adam brought death upon all mankind, and also the single act of the one Redeemer cleared away the offenses of those who accept him. Think about this verse. Colossians 3 verse 3 For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. If you understand this one verse, you won't fear death as a Christian. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Do you truly understand what this verse truly means? My life is hid in Christ in God. Paul deals with one of the basic aspects of the Christian life. Believers are in union with Christ. We are one with Him. Union with Christ means He is the captain of our salvation. He is your advocate with the Father. To understand how important it is to have Jesus Christ as your advocate, you first need to understand Satan and what he is doing, and the case he is bringing forward regarding you. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Have you ever been in court and have you ever seen a prosecuting attorney doing their job? I remember going to court and watching a prosecuting attorney present their case to the judge, jury and the audience. This prosecuting attorney pulled no punches. What he did is level best to get the defendant who was standing on trial convicted. He presented his case. Witness after witness, evidence after evidence, it was almost as if the prosecuting attorney had a personal vendetta against the defendant. And I saw something about Satan in that courtroom. I am not saying prosecuting attorneys are Satan at all. I am saying that the Bible described Satan as the accuser of the brethren, who accuses the brethren day and night. He is described as that adversary, and that is the nature of Satan. That is the nature of the devil, Diabolus, Diabolos, the evil one, the father of lies. From the different names of Satan, we can come to understand the very nature of Satan. He is one who seeks and destroys. He is one who torments and persecutes. The devil is one who accuses. And that is what he does to you. He points the finger and throws accusations, just like a prosecuting attorney. And all of his accusations are true. Satan is not lying, he is telling the cold hard truth about you. Yes, he is. You are a thief because you have stolen before. You are a liar because you have lied before. Satan is accusing you and stating the complete truth about you, and he is coming with receipts and evidence regarding you. On June the 29th, 1988, 
He committed adultery knowing full well that it was a sin, and he even went on to lie about it. He is guilty. On July the 7th, 2010, she prayed to you and promised you she will never commit that sin again. Ten days later, just ten days later, she broke her promise and committed that exact same sin again. She is guilty. He is guilty. He has fornicated. She is guilty. She divorced her husband when she had no biblical grounds for divorce. He is guilty. He lied about his whereabouts. Satan will attempt to get you convicted. However, you have a savior. However, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. It doesn't matter how good Satan's case is. It doesn't matter how much evidence he has collected against you. You have an advocate with the Father, an advocate who knows all the correct terminology, an advocate who will stand up for you on your behalf. And do you know what a sobering thought is? The sobering thought is that your advocate, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, agrees that you are indeed guilty. And he agrees that all evidence shows and proves that you are guilty. But the Lord Jesus Christ then highlights that he satisfied the judgment. He paid the price for your sins and transgressions. And because of this very reason, as far as God is concerned, every sin you and I have ever committed, past, present and future, was dealt with on point on the cross. Salvation is not through your little list of morality or your little list of do's and don'ts. Salvation is through one man and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. For the saint in God, born again believer, your life is hid with Christ in God. And there will come a time where you take off the corruption and put on the incorruption. A time where you will say goodbye to the temporal and hello to the eternal. There will come a time when God will call you and me home and this flesh will fall back to the ground from whence it came from but when this happens that is not the end for a believer because your life is hid with Christ in God and the Lord Jesus Christ said he that believeth in me shall never die these are the words of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He that believeth in me shall never die. Jesus does not, of course, mean that the believer will not die physically. Lazarus was dead even then, and millions of Jesus' followers have died since. But he means that he will not die in the sense in which death has eternal significance. The believer will never die but simply make an instant transition from an old life to a new life. They stepping from one side to another, crossing a line. Those that believe in Jesus Christ appear to die, but yet they live. They are not in the grave, they are forever with the Lord. Death cannot kill a believer. It can only usher them into a freer form of life. We tend to look in the mirror and think that this body is the real you, but that is not the real you at all. Your spirit is the real you. This body is dust and it will fade away. And if you look at the wrinkles on your face, the sagging of your skin, the pains and aches in your body are all signs that show that this body is fading as it is. And that this body will one day go to the grave. But this body is not your life. Your life is hid in Christ and death is something that a lot of people fear because death is something that has haunted and stalked mankind. But as a child of God, you need to know and remember that your life is hid with Christ in God. The moment you die, 
you will be received into the hands of the Lord, and Jesus will confess you before his Father and all the holy angels. This is a theme we see in the Bible, Jesus confessing individuals before God the Father and all the angels in heaven. This genuinely brings tears to my eyes because I don't think we have the words or even the expression to convey the emotions of how you will feel Jesus the Advocate confessing you to all of heaven. Matthew 10 verse 32 Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Just imagine how moved, just imagine the emotion you will feel, Jesus regarding you as one of his sheep. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. My sermon today has three points, three points which can be derived from this one verse. Point number one, who is the Son of Man? Point number two, where did the Son of Man come from? Point number three, what did the Son of Man come to earth to do? Point number one, who is the Son of Man? The Son of Man is a title for Jesus Christ, which is rarely used outside of the Gospels. The title Son of Man is referenced four times outside the Gospels, according to my knowledge. In Acts 7.56, Hebrews 2.6, Revelation 1.13, and Revelation 14.14. 14. The common understanding is that the title Son of God highlights the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ which it does, and that Son of Man highlights the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Son of Man, that is a human being, and He is the Son of God, in that He has always existed as the Eternal Begotten One, who comes forth from the Father forever. He always has, and He always will. He is the second person of the Trinity, with all the divine nature fully in Him. The humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ is something not spoken of enough. We have a God who came and saw humanity and life through the eyes of a human being. When God took on flesh, he experienced in every way what it means to be a human, except sin. Jesus Christ knows what it is to marvel. We see this in Matthew 8.10. Jesus Christ knows what it is for the soul to be very sorrowful. We see this in Matthew 26, 38. Jesus Christ knows what it is to be deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. We see this in John 11:33. Jesus Christ knows what it is to weep. We see this in John 11:35. Because Jesus experienced being human, he can empathize with our situations and speak to the Father with complete understanding on our behalf. He is a God who understands whatever you are going through. Praise God, the Son of Man is the Lord Jesus Christ. Point number two, where did the Son of Man come from? He came from heaven to earth. One of the biggest mistakes an individual can make is to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ began in Bethlehem of Judea. That is incorrect. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is from age to age. John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. With this dramatic phrase, Jesus told them that he was the eternal God, existing not only during the time of Abraham, but before unto eternity past. Strictly speaking, you and I cannot say such a statement. I had a beginning. I was not around during or before the time of Abraham. I can't say a statement like this, neither can you. But the Lord Jesus Christ can. Three times, three times in John chapter eight, the Lord Jesus Christ uses the phrase, I am. The ancient Greek phrase is ego eme, which was the same term used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Jesus's day to describe the voice from the burning bush. 
Jesus Christ came from heaven. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, we read, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of a man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Point number three, what did the Son of Man come to earth to do? Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. God did not come to seek and save perfect people. If you are a perfectly upright person who has never sinned, who has never fallen short of the standard of the Word of God, then I'm sorry to tell you, Jesus didn't come for you. If you are a perfect person, you don't need a Savior. You are your own Savior. If you are lost and feel as if you are not good enough to earn your way to heaven, which you cannot do anyways, if you are a sinner, Jesus came for you. Jesus came for sinners and to those of us who were lost and now have been found. It is your duty to continue the mission of our Lord and Savior. We are to seek and to save, seek and to save, even if it is one person or friend that we bring to the glorious light of the gospel message, that is amazing. Let us have a hunger and a thirst to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone loved you and cared for you enough to share the gospel with you, whether it was a parent, a friend, a teacher. It's your turn to love someone enough to share the gospel. One person. Just make them your mission, that you will minister the Lord Jesus Christ to that one person. The truth is that many of us are neglectful to the command of Christ to us during his ascension. At his death, Christ never asked us to celebrate his birth or his death. He gave us a commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, which says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Yes, I am not against the celebration of the Lord's birth or Easter. They are both vital parts of the remembrance of the life of Christ. However, what joy of celebration is there when souls are falling to hell in multitudes? What makes the heart of God most glad is not our festivities, but the number of souls that have come to know the Lord and have become saved through our sharing of his gospel. In Luke 15, 7, Jesus made a very powerful statement about saints and sinners, and I would like for us to meditate on it. It says, I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. When is the last time you caused joy in heaven? When is the last time the whole heaven stood up and rejoiced because you led someone to Christ? Some of us have been Christians 30, 40 years, but never once have our actions caused an eruption of joy in heaven. Heaven erupted with joy when you gave your life to Christ. Right now, God wants you to keep causing the heavens to rejoice by helping to save souls from hell through the gospel of Christ. If we could see the corridor of hell just for one minute, we would not be so lukewarm about soul winning. Hell is a terrible place. It was not originally meant for humans. It was created for the devil and the fallen angels. Multitudes of people are perishing every day. They all face eternal doom. They are unknowingly stepping out into an eternity of damnation. And we are living with the assurance of heaven. We should not be comfortable with souls going into damnation. The Christian life is not every man for himself. Yes, salvation is an individual journey, but we should not be comfortable with others going to hell. 
If you have loved ones who have not accepted the gospel and you have been attempting to get them to see the glorious light of the Lord Jesus Christ for years or even decades, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep fighting for them. Keep praying for them. Prayer is a spiritual thing. You will be surprised at how prayer can soften the most hardened of hearts to the Lord. Don't give up on them. Continue to show the goodness of the Lord in their life. God is a good God. He is a faithful and loving God. Don't give up on that husband or wife or child or mother or father. Keep praying for them. Don't give up on those friends. Keep praying for them. When I became a pastor, the way I viewed the world changed. Instead of seeing people, I began to see eternal souls, knowing that they will always exist in one of two places. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says that it is by grace that we are saved. Our salvation is not of works, otherwise we would boast in our self-righteousness. If you are saved by grace, then you do not merit it. Therefore, heaven places a demand over our lives to arise for the salvation of others. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached. And for those who do, there is a crown in heaven waiting for you. This is the assurance of your reward.